My name is Steve Mantis. I'm a member of the organizing committee for the Bancroft Institute and the studies of workers' compensation and work injury. And I'm also the chair of the research committee for the Ontario Network of Injured Workers Groups. So a little bit about Bancroft. Uh, it is a vehicle, you know, with no staff and no office and no money to try to further uh, exploring the, uh, the partnerships and the connection between the injured worker movement, the injured worker community, and, and the academic and, and university community. Uh, as a member of the injured worker movement, our, our goal really has been to make a system that is you know, uh, pre presumably put there to help people when they become injured and disabled to work more effectively for all workers before injury and, and after injury. And part of that process for us, you know, has been working with the decision makers to try to bring the evidence of our own experience forward to help inform the development of policy and practice and legislation so that it works better for us. Along the way, you know, when we meet with uh, the decision makers, the Minister of Labour or the, the senior management at the WCB, you know, they've said to us, well, those are nice stories you're telling us, but gives us facts and figures. Can I kind of back this up? Let's get some peer-reviewed stuff so that we really know what's going on. And so some 15, 20 years ago, or maybe more, we started then trying to find academics, researchers that would help us develop that kind of material. And along the way, we've been learning, you know, kind of step by step, learning lots of times from our mistakes and, and from our successes. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we, as we had done in the past, in trying to bring together academics and activists, we hosted a meeting at Injured Workers Consultants, Community Legal Clinic over on the Danforth. Uh, and as we had done a number of times before, uh, we kind of brainstormed together and, and tried to say what are the issues that we need to understand more fully, that we need to research and also take action on. And divide it up, kind of voting with our feet to say these are the areas I want to work on and, and had small group discussions and, and when we came back uh, we had a number of kind of research projects that we decided to work on. And that was the beginning of a cura that we were successful in getting, uh, that we really started that process like in 2004, 2005. That continued on until about 2012, and we did all kinds of stuff together. And today, here it is three years later, the work that was done in that time, some of it is still coming to maturity. And, and we're kind of going, okay, how do we, what do we do here? How do we take this research and help make the system work better for all workers? So this session in a way, and the one tomorrow, is a bit of a time for us to kind of step back and reflect a little bit. How have we done? On one level, I think we've done we're really good. But there's always room for improvement. And so we start off our session tonight bringing in two uh, academics who have a long career in working in partnership with workers, with community activists, but in different fields than what we're working on. There is some overlap. And so this, their experience, the hope is, is will help inform us 
in, in our partnerships uh, and learn from what they have done and what, what they have learned along the way. And, uh, and they may give us some tips and hints about how we can then work together more effectively. The, tomorrow, we then come back to looking at what is some of the research we've done together, particularly on the poverty experienced by injured workers and their families. And we'll have three different research projects that took different approaches, all kind of looking at the same question in a way. Be able to understand how those worked, you know, what, what are the, the pressures that we feel internal and external, uh, and, and what have we done with them and what can we continue to do with them to once again try to improve the system for all of us. Even though uh, Karen and Wayne uh, have been working in different fields, we do have some overlap. And back about 10 years ago, when we were just starting our Cura project, we had Karen come down and uh, did a presentation for us on some of the work she was doing. It took place over at the friend's house uh, that we had many of our meetings at. So it's really nice to kind of welcome her back when we were just getting going, and now we're 10 years old, we're so much more mature, <laughs> and, uh, and, and continue our discussion. And, and Wayne, it's funny, you know, when we had that meeting in 2004 and we decided to go for our cura, you know, the person who came up with that and said, you know, we've got so much we want to do, we should go with the cura. I mean, like, what's cura? What the heck's that? Uh, Community University Research Alliance. That was Alice DeWolf. And Alice worked closely with Wayne and had already had a history of working in partnership uh, she was kind of the halfway between. She was kind of an activist and kind of an academic and, and uh, helped us along that path. So uh, a couple of things too. Uh, there are some freebies on the side. There's a, a little review of uh, Karen's book. There's our uh, Interworkers newsletter. Uh, and Wayne brought their most recent report precarity penalty. I really encourage, I just read this on the plane coming down yesterday from Thunder Bay, from the Thunder Bay Bay, uh, and definitely worth it. It's, uh, it's totally great, and it is free. And I, then that makes me say, oh geez, I hate to say this, but uh, the one that's not free is also terrific. Uh, I got to do a little book review of Karen's book, Pain and Prejudice, and uh, I was totally inspired. So uh, for a $20 investment, we've got uh, a few books here available. Uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, and Wayne has a number of other publications as well. Uh, the one uh, previous one, when was your book published with Alice? 2011. 2011. Yeah. And I also see, looking at precarious employment, as we, when we see what that's like, I kind of go, that's the injured worker experience. You know, having no power and feeling vulnerable all the time and kind of fearful, I kind of go, so I kind of go, there's a real overlap here in terms of our experiences. So with that, let me check the time and invite Wayne. You want to take the first one? You bet, okay. Uh, we'll uh, be sharing some of his insights. and. Uh, Welcome, Wayne Luchuk. Great. Can you give me sort of 10, 10, and 5? Yep. Otherwise, I'm liable just to go until tomorrow. Sure. <laughs> okay, so um, it's a real pleasure uh, for me uh, to be here. So Ellen asked me to talk about uh, quantitative approaches to occupational health and safety. I have to admit, when she first asked me, I was a bit uh, surprised because I actually don't, didn't see myself as a quantitative researcher. So um, it, it forced me to actually do some inspection because, of course, I have been doing quantitative research for the last uh, 20 years. 
when I think about this issue, there's, I mean, there's a couple of books that I, um, that I think about that I think are really quite helpful. And let me just start with that. So one is by uh, Stephen Zilek, Z-I-L-I-A-K, and Deirdre McCloskey. The, the title is fantastic, The Cult of Significance, How the Standard Error Costs Us Jobs, Justice, and Lives. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a damning critique of a lot of the uh, empirical statistical analysis that quantitative researchers um, do. And, and McCloskey is probably uh, one of the leading American economic historians uh, of the last uh, 30 years. So I mean, this is coming from sort of the top of the academic pile, not, uh, not the bottom where I, where I troll. Uh, the, the other uh, uh, book that I find really very helpful is Sylvia Noble Tesh's T-E-S-H, Uncertain Hazards, Environmental Activists, and Scientific Proof. And I think both of those books really uh, provide a caution uh, about what academics do and what we should be careful uh, of uh, thinking about. And I, I pay a lot of attention to their work when I think of my own stuff. So uh, myself, I, I began my uh, career as, a, as an economic student in this institution. In fact, you know what? I actually took a course in this room. Uh, ut uh, what was it? Utopia in the English novel. I think it was the best economics course I took because I really continue to have this utopic vision of where, where we should be going. Um, and uh, I, I pretty quickly became disenchanted with what was going on in economics because it was abstract and it was empirical. It was the economics of no place uh, at no time. And so I, I sort of moved over into economic history quite, uh, quite quickly. And as, as life would have it, just as I decided I wanted to be an economic historian, um, the economic historians decided they wanted to be economists. And so they wanted to start collecting data and doing empirical analysis and building models and whatnot. And I wanted to continue doing economic history in the, in the great tradition of Adam Smith, uh, Karl Marx, uh, John Maynard Keynes, which is very institutional based. I mean, they had data in it, but it was still a very institutional rich uh, analysis. So I packed up my bags and went to England um, and, and, and I did my, my, my research uh, there. And, and, I, and I wrote, uh, you know, as I was, I was watching what was going on in, in economic history, I became more and more concerned because, again, the economists, they wanted to, be, they wanted to think of themselves as economists. Uh, the economic historians, they wanted to be economists. Uh, and so they were behaving just like the economists, and I think that was a bit of a disadvantage. And it was at the moment when an economic historian published a book that said slavery was good for the slaves. It was at that moment I said, there's something fundamentally wrong here, right? I mean, that is just not consistent with my intuition. But <laughs> empirically, it was, it, was, it, was, it was proved. And so, uh, you know, when I started doing my research, I, I kept those things uh, in mind. So I began my research with a pretty heavy dose of suspicion of quantitative analysis. And I think that begs the question, what the hell am I doing, doing mainly quantitative analysis in the rest of my life? So, and, and, as, and as I was thinking about it, and you know, being forced to think about to prepare these, these comments, I, I began to understand really what was probably going on in my head better than I did when I started this. So in some ways, I, I do see myself as a positive researcher. I think there are patterns. And I think it's the job of a researcher to uncover those, uh, uh, uncover those patterns. So we need to search, you know, collect data on variables, um, search for associations between variables, uh, and test hypotheses. I think the problem is that since the 1940s, that positive approach has meant almost exclusively numbers, quantitative analysis. And what has disappeared is the, is the richer institutional analysis of talking to people, trying to understand um, exactly uh, what's, what's going on. And in essence, I think what we need also is, is a realist approach, whether you're a critical realist or just a realist, someone who says, Look, there's more than one way to understand what's going on in the world. There's more than one way to interpret the same set of data. Uh, context is incredibly important. And so I think what certainly I've tried to incorporate in my own research is, is to incorporate both a, 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 a value in collecting numbers and collecting data, but at the same time understanding that's a really problematic research strategy. It can lead you seriously astray unless you are willing to say, well, those numbers may be just nonsense, uh, and then we really need to talk to people and interpret what's going on uh, through their eyes. So in terms of my own research career, I've been incredibly lucky, uh, fortuitous, to work with a number of community groups uh, over the last 25 years. So first I, I began working with uh, the CAW, trying to understand the implications of lean production, uh, and I, I formed a, a partnership with David Robertson, who was head of the research, 
Uh, and for 15, almost 20 years, we did research together. And, and what I learned is, well, I brought certain skills to that partnership. Uh, David brought other skills that were really quite important and, and prevented us from making uh, too many foolish mistakes. That didn't mean we didn't make any, but certainly prevented us from making too many foolish mistakes. And providing a richness to the interpretation of our data, uh, which I thought was quite, is quite important. The last 10 years, I've been really quite lucky to form a partnership now with United Way Toronto. Uh, and, and so the report that is on the table uh, is really the, the second of, of two reports that we released. Um, the full reports are available at our website, www.pepso.ca. Um, and they provide a ton of both quantitative data, but also qualitative data. So always looking at the numbers through a qualitative lens, talking to people and trying to understand what exactly um, the, data, uh, the data means. So as I said, you know, the challenge is to, to do quantitative research, but actually don't believe too much the numbers that you get, because I think the numbers can be actually quite, uh, quite misleading. And I'm going to give you an example of something that I'm actually involved in right now, which is the whole debate uh, about whether our labor markets are changing and whether employment is becoming more precarious. If you rely on the Stats Canada data, which collects data on who's in temporary employment, who's in own account self-employment, uh, you, you need to conclude that there hasn't been very much change in the last 20 years. That the, the percentage of, of the reporting population who are in those two positions has more or less uh, been stable since uh, the late 80s or the early 90s. Now living in Hamilton, where Stelco has disappeared in that period, working at a university where the tenure track position has disappeared in that period, I just find it a bit hard to, to, to accept that the labor market hasn't, hasn't changed. And again, I think that forces us to say, well, what, what are those numbers saying? What is the quantitative data really saying? There's a really neat little study that's come out of Denmark recently. Uh, Denmark is a jurisdiction where workers get surveyed and asked, are you in temporary employment? But employers also have to respond for those same workers uh, whether or not those workers are in temporary employment, because that changes the entitlement of these workers for certain kinds of benefits. So you get two observations on the same person, one from the worker, one from, uh, from the employer. What's really fascinating about this study is it shows that workers systematically underestimate how temporary their jobs are. That workers think they're in permanent jobs, but when the employer responds to the state, they're not in permanent jobs, they're, they're in temporary jobs. And the error measurement is quite significant, as much as 50%. So if we apply that to the Canadian data, rather than seeing 20% of workers in precarious employment, we're now talking 30% of workers in precarious employment. That's a, that's a pretty significant change. The other problem with this, the kind of survey data and, and these numbers, so when you ask someone a question, then you get a number, and, whoa, that number, that's, that's, that's real. Uh, the problem is people misinterpret what's going on. They don't understand their own situation. And, and one person we interviewed is quite insightful from our, the first book we wrote with uh, Marlea Clark and, and Alice. Um, we interviewed this individual, and this individual, the first time we interviewed him was in temporary employment, working through a temp agency where he's on one week, one day, two week contracts, clearly was precarious. About a year later, we did some follow-up surveys because we wanted to see if anybody was escaping their situation, and so we went back and interviewed this person. He was really enthusiastic. He told us he was in permanent employment. As we probed further, what we found he had a six-month contract. So he had, he had interpreted impermanence in light of being a t a t an agency worker. Once he got a six-month contract, he thought you know, he had uh, a standard employment relationship and was ready to challenge the workers at the Ford Motor Company. So I think you know, one of the issues here is that numbers are important, but they're, they can be misleading, they can be incomplete, they can point you in the wrong direction, and we'll have a realist understanding understanding the context and people who are actually experiencing what the numbers uh, pretend to measure, uh, you can get yourself into uh, a lot of trouble. Okay, so the only way to really get around this, at least in my view, is to, to never just do quantitative research, but to combine that with qualitative research. And equally important, that when you're doing quantitative research, do it with partners that have on the ground understanding of what's going on. So in the case of my work with the CAW, uh, we had auto workers sitting at the table who understood what a 22 second job cycle meant. 
Um, you know, what, what uh, working for eight hours a day uh, on, on, on these kind of jobs, putting in spark plugs really meant. Uh, when I work with people at the United Way Toronto, I'm working with a group of people who have a very deep understanding of the social problems going on in our community, where the stress points are. And to be frank, that allows me to see my data through very different glasses than the ones I have on. I, I, I just gain a whole lot from doing that, and I really think that's quite uh, important. Ten minutes past. So um, let, let me just talk. I, one of the first things I did as a, uh, as a researcher is I, I, the, the compensation board asked me to have a look at uh, the WorkWell program. Uh, and they were a bit confused because they had a large number of firms who uh, scored D minus on the WorkWell audit. So that's the audit that actually says, you know, do you have a procedure, do you have a reporting procedure, does the committees meet and whatnot. They were, uh, they were scoring, uh, or sorry, they were scoring A plus on that. So they seem to have everything in place, um, but they have D minus safety records, right? So they, had the, they were doing the right things, they had a whole bunch of accidents. And then you have another group of companies that weren't doing anything um, and had great accident records. Uh, they had almost no accidents. So, you know, what, what's going on? Uh, and does everybody with a good accident record, do they deserve a, a premium rebate? And it was really only through interviewing both people on the management side and people on the labor side that it became clear sort of what was going on. So one group of worker firms, they're just managing their claims. Yeah, they don't have any process, but they don't have any claims either because they don't let people have claims. They challenge everything. Um, on the other hand, firms that had very well-developed uh, health and safety procedures, they could still have a lot of claims because they had a union that could back up their workers willing to make a claim, right? And so what it really told us is that yeah, the data is nonsense. If you relied on the data and, it, and, and just didn't go deeper, you would get absolutely uh, the, wrong, uh, the wrong issue. So context matters, uh, and the numbers told only uh, half uh, of the story. Likewise, in our book, uh, Working Without Commitments, um, you know, we collected a lot of survey data, and the first thing that the survey data showed is that being in precarious employment was good for your health. What the hell's going on there? How's that possible? You know, at that point, I thought, I really made a mistake here in my research. Um, you know, how can that possibly be? Because uh, you know, your intuition tells you that can't possibly be. The insecurity of not having a permanent job and all these things surely has a, a negative effect. It was only when we began talking to people that we began to understand more clearly what's going on. That precarious employment has different effects on different kinds of people. And it's their context of those people that really matters. So the young person living in mom and dad's basement, working through a temp agency, maybe this is, this is just fine. It doesn't have any health effects because you know, they work when they want to. They, 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 they can always fall back on mom and dad for money. I've sort of seen that uh, firsthand. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's happy times. Whereas the person who's 35 years old with a mortgage and two kids who's relying on employment through a temp agency, this is going to be disastrous for their health. Uh, and likewise, the older person who's maybe into a second career, uh, has a pension, has some skills and whatnot, for them maybe it's, it's not a problem. So precarious employment affects different people different ways. If you lump everyone together, what you get is nothing. You, get, you, you find either precarious employment is good for people or you certainly don't find the negative, uh, negative impact. So again, I think it's, it's how you interpret the data that really matters, and there you need the context, you need the people on the floor uh, who know what's going on. Likewise, with you know, my more recent work with United Way Toronto, I mean, this, 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 this project has had an impact you know, well beyond my expectations. I'm pretty used to writing things in journals and publishing books, and uh, uh, my mom and dad read them. Uh, and I, I'm not saying too much about it, but they wouldn't understand what was going on in, in, in the stuff that I'm writing. So, you know, I, I think that's the academic experience. We don't really get a lot of people looking at what we're doing. You publish an academic book and you sell a thousand copies, it's a bestseller, right? You publish in a journal, I think other than the referees, it's never clear who reads the stuff in these journals. Um, the work we're doing with United Way uh, has had already about 50,000 downloads globally. Uh, so, you know, people are actually looking at it and talking about it, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's had an impact from coast to coast. And a lot of that reflects both the message that we're giving out, but how we're delivering that message. And a lot of the credit for that goes to the United Way Toronto and, and how, they, uh, how they manage these things. So, the thing that caused a splash that caught the media's eye was a quantitative uh, uh, oh, finding. The finding that 
only 50% of people in Hamilton and Toronto uh, between the ages of 25 and 65, so not youth, not old people, but between 25 and 65, um, are in jobs that are permanent, they expect to have in a year, uh, and that pay them some benefits. The other 50% are in something else. They are operating with a degree of, of insecurity. You know, the, glow, the, 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 the Toronto Star, their eyes kind of lit up when they saw that, uh, and they said, we need to sort of talk about this. This is really up their alleys. But I think why the story has had legs is not because of that, as, as important as that is, it's because behind that is a whole interpretation of the context of what does that mean? What does it mean for families? What does it mean for communities? And I think, and the finding that it's not just low pay and poverty that's a problem, although that is a problem, it's people who have modest or even high incomes, but where the stream of income is irregular have a problem. So you can be making seventy or eighty thousand dollars this year, but if you don't know you're going to be making seven or eighty thousand next year, that's actually quite stressful. And it can be just as stressful as being in a job that pays you forty thousand this year, and you're going to have it next year, and you can have it the year after that, right? So the, the, it's that story that kind of brought this issue to a larger audience. I think is one reason why um, this has had uh, had some legs. So I think the challenge here is that quantitative data data is tricky. It's easy to misunderstand, it's difficult to draw valid references from, and hence, slavery is good for slaves, right? <laughs> obviously. Okay, so the second thing I want to talk about, and this is, this is kind of my own um, uh, ax to grind uh, with, with my colleagues in economics and other places, we are increasingly dependent on significance tests, <coughs> which means we want to be confident that what we find is actually, there's a relationship between uh, two, two factors. Uh, and we do that, I, I'm sure you heard in the, in the, in the, in the press these, constantly these reports, 19 times out of 20 of this poll is accurate within three percentage points. Can you imagine the anarchy if it was only 18 times out of 20? I mean, my God, the world would fall apart. Uh, and the issue here is that for most academics, that 19 out of 20 translates into a 95% confidence interval, and if it's not within 95% confidence that it's true, you throw it away. Again, McCloskey, they provide a, a really excellent example of why this is, as, as, as he calls it, or, or she calls it, sorry, it wasn't he, it's now she, uh, why she calls this a parlor game. Imagine that uh, you're out with your child uh, on the street and you stop off at a hot dog stand and you buy a hot dog. Your child's only two, two and a half years old. Uh, so you buy the hot dog, you cross the, this very busy street uh, at the light and you're now halfway down the block uh, and at that point you realize, I forgot the mustard. So you have to ask, okay, do I rush across the street, uh, in the middle of the street, and, and, and go get some mustard? Luckily, uh, uh, an academic has done a study. They've made good use of their PhD students, uh, and they've had them crossing the street randomly, back and forth, and they found out 19 times out of 20, um, you'll get across the street without getting hit by a car. <laughs> this data is posted on a, uh, a, a board, uh, and, and the person reads this and says, okay, uh, 19, out of 19 times out of 20, I'll be successful crossing the street to get mustard. Uh, the other time, too bad. Do you cross the street to get mustard? Well, of course not. You go without the mustard, right? Are you, are you really so desperate to get the mustard? Even though you can have confidence you'll get across the street at least 19 times out of 20, um, do you go get the mustard? No, you don't. But let's suppose uh, you really want mustard, so you walk back to the traffic light, you go across the street, you get the mustard, then you go back to the traffic light and you cross the street, and, and, and then you realize, I forgot my kid. <laughs> right? And the kid is at the hot dog stand and is about to cross the street. Now you ask yourself, do you rush across this busy street with the risk of getting killed one times out of 20 to save your kid? Well, of course you do. Absolutely, of course you cross the street. And I think the whole point here is that that, that confidence measure is meaningless without understanding what are we, what's the issue we're trying to get at. Obviously, 19 out of, times out of 20, yeah, you don't go get mustard. 19 times out of 20, you do go and save your kid. Abs absolutely. Um, and increasingly, academics have really focused almost exclusively on things that pass this 19 times out of 20 test. They're not asking themselves, are we trying to save a kid or are we trying to put mustard on a hot dog? And I think in occupational health and safety, that is an incredibly important issue. And again, Tesh would, uh, really stresses this. Sometimes we're looking for uh, needles in a haystack, but these are lethal needles. Right? And statistical analysis is biased 
against finding a needle uh, in, in a haystack. So your, your intuition uh, doesn't, even though you intuitively know there's needles out there, it doesn't really um, uh, uh, add up. So I think one way to, to get around this is to use this thing called substantive significance. And substantive significance, which was really, when this work was first being done at the end of the 19th century by Student, who's the author of the famous Student T-Test, um, he was recommending that you actually look at the combination of what's the size of the thing, the importance of the thing you're looking at, and what's the probability, the accuracy of your measurement. And when you multiply these two things together, then you can have something uh, that's actually quite uh, meaningful. And I think the problem right now, all we focus on is the 19 out of 20. We don't ask the bigger question, if we reject this, will someone die from some kind of exposure? Uh, and so I, D McCloskey talks about needing to be focused, it's a highly scientific term, the oomph of an analysis, right? Uh, and I think that's really quite uh, important. Five minutes left. Okay, perfect. So the last question I was asked to, to talk about is how do researchers explain findings to others? And I think this is really quite important. Um, academics, we just do a bad job. Uh, I think we write things that are often incomprehensible. Uh, we publish them in places where, uh, where they're not accessible to the public. Uh, and often they're rarely read. Uh, and, we do, and, and we do this to ensure that what we publish passes through this cultural uh, screen of uh, academic evaluation, referees, uh, with the goal of sniffing out false findings. You know, and that's important because yeah, there's some nonsense out there. In fact, some people have, have consciously published papers that were nonsense and got them through the refereeing process. Uh, so it, it's not a perfect process and so we shouldn't think about it. You know, with my work with United Way, I really learned a lot about uh, success in getting your ideas out there in a way that universities are, are absolutely uh, hopeless. United Way Toronto has a communications department. They have actually professionals whose job it is to get uh, uh, ideas in the hands of professionals uh, and, and policy makers. And they have real resources. They have three people whose job that is, and I was really lucky enough to work with them. They understand uh, the importance of writing reports that are not just clear, but in, where the ideas kind of jump off the page. So how do, you, how do you place graphs? How do you color graphs? How much content do you put on a page? How do you mix uh, uh, quantitative and, 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 and qualitative data? Uh, and we make our data available free. So we paid for publishing our material uh, both hard copies like we have there um, and online. So all of our reports are available free online. Uh, both the, the two main reports are over 100 pages and there's summaries of that. It's all available free, um, free online. I think what I've learned from that is as important as refereed publications are and that whole process of sniffing out false uh, findings, it's an incomplete and imprecise project and in the process we create walls which prevent the public from understanding uh, what goes on. And so increasingly I publish now in the gray literature area uh, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that with 40,000 eyeballs, well I guess it's 80,000 eyeballs if there's 40,000 people, uh, looking at the data that is as evaluated and certain to be true as the three external referees on a, on a, on a, on a grant uh, or a, a journal paper uh, and then getting it published uh, in, in a journal. And so I think that we need to, if we want to really get our ideas out there, uh, not that we abandon academics, because that has a role, but we give more evidence, <coughs> emphasis to the gray literature, to making things available free, uh, to designing them in a way that you don't have to have a PhD to understand. My mom, she enjoys reading these new reports much better than she did any of my journal articles. <laughs> I'll stop there.